I'm, um, I'm Paul, you may not know, um, but I'm one of the founding partners of uh, Made Thought, myself and Ben. We founded Made Thought um, back in 2000. We studied together. We worked at North Design for a few years after we graduated, and then we just kind of wanted to do our own thing and um, with no major plan. And we're here sort of 19, shit, man, 19 years later. Um, so hopefully, this should be of interest. Is this working? Right. I won't go back to what we've done or things. We've now got a website. That took 18 years. Um, and there's a new thing called um, Instagram as well. So if anyone wants to look at what we do, if you don't know us, then um, you can take a peek. So obviously tonight we were um, asked to come and talk about um, where art and science collide. So I thought we probably should need to be quite honest with ourselves. Because when I started thinking about what should I talk about, I thought, shit. Um, we're not artists, um, but also we're, um, we're also not scientists either. So I kind of got a bit worried about what do I talk about, because we were asked not to make it about our work, so, but I kind of wanted it to link back to what we do. Um, so I thought I'd talk about actually one of our clients who um, have been amazing. Um, they've been a client for seven years, and that person is um, GF Smith, the paper company. What and this may, not, this may be a surprise, why, well, where, you know, where's art or science in a, in a paper merchant? But firstly, the best thing about GF Smith is, um, firstly, they're a big supporter of events like this, so they, they give a lot back. But also, they're amazingly supportive um, of us as creatives. And I think, um, when I started thinking about what we could talk about tonight, there was one particular project that we've worked on with them recently, which, for me, was unusual for us, because um, it it required a lot of kind of behind the scenes work and, and, and in order to reach a, a visual result. Um, but I just thought it'd be this, it, it, it kind of, it really demonstrates what we, what we think is a successful kind of collision of, of these two sort of um, things. So obviously we've been, we've worked with GF Smith for a long time and we've done loads of cool stuff, loads of beautiful sort of opportunities they've given us, whether that's spatial, print, um, you know, digital. But, um, Actually, now this is a little thing about actually everything we have done for them. When I said about how they're kind of, uh, GF Smith are really supportive, what I mean by that is across the time we've been working with them, we've got to a position now where we, we kind of inspire each other and we, we almost write our own 
briefs in a way. So, you know, they've got obviously things they need to communicate or things they need to sell. Remember, this is a company that doesn't even make paper, they just sell paper. But the way they do it and the way they think and the way they inspire us um, to actually think that bit harder and that bit more creatively kind of led to the, to the project that I'm going to talk about tonight. You saw a snip of it in there. Um, it all sort of started... Um, in, I think, 2017 at the start, when John Haslam, who you, who you might, some of you might have met, who's the MD at, um, at GF Smith, came to us with, oh, guys, I want you to do a great project for us. Um, I want you to come up with a new colour. I was like, well, it's kind of, kind of difficult, that, because um, a new colour is quite difficult to find. What he meant was, in their range of papers, they wanted to make a new colour of paper. So he said, oh, can you, can you guys you know, work out what this colour could be? We're like, well, you know... Is, 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 that, is that kind of the best way of coming at it? Could we not do something a bit more interesting? So we came up with the idea of actually, could we, could we ask our audience to actually help us achieve that? So um, we, built a, we built a really simple, um, uh, well, we didn't, someone who knows how to do this did. Um, we, built a, we built a small part of their website, you know, it was called the World's Favourite Colour, and it was its own standalone, standalone site where people got the opportunity to kind of mix their own colour colour that they felt was their favourite colour. They mixed it, they gave it a name, they submitted it, and um, they, they, they kind of wrote a little line about why this colour was of interest to them. So we thought, actually, you know what, apart from like me, Ben, and everyone else that works on Made Thought, someone else might also pick a colour. Um, what was quite amazing, and I, can't, I don't know the actual numbers, but it was something in between 30 and 40,000 people took part. Now, we were amazed. Everyone was amazed. It actually turned out to be, end up being one of the largest colour studies, independent sort of colour studies, ever actually um, done. And, you know, where you just ask, you know, asking people to, to submit this kind of information. So we were kind of, like, pretty knocked out by, um, by the amount of kind of interest that it actually got. It even made, like, the, the, you know, the, the, the Sunday papers. People picked up on this and reported on it. You know, it's like... We didn't have any PR on it. It was just it just got picked up as this thing of interest. So it was kind of amazing. We also spoke to some really interesting people about what they thought about their colour. We got some people. This is the creative director of Mulberry. I'm living in UK in very British colour. Can I cheat and have a couple of colours in 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 very particular references? Behold, slime green. This is my favourite colour beyond all others. My favourite colour is hot pink. Uh, my favourite colour is green. I've chosen teal and I particularly like this colour because it's effectively hyper real so it appears very infrequently in nature. I think it's a beautiful pink actually. It's probably kind of quite Rajasthani, kind of quite Indian and I think it's, it's the kind of that sort of touch of neon, that colour before it actually becomes too vulgar. It's just that right touch of brightness in there. It's a green that I'm currently partaking in on my face uh, most days at the moment. I can remember very specifically falling in love with slime green. We first became known as jelly makers, or as we called it, jelly mongers. And um, so we've had a lot of slime in our, in our lives, ranging from exploding jellies to vast um, jellies the size of two Olympic swimming pools. And in all those cases, slime green has played a key role. Furniture, floors, ceramics. I mean, I use green a lot. I love spending time in nature and in the, in the countryside, and so I respond to that, the greens of that. Why the red? Uh... It does occur in nature, but only in very, very special instances, like um, hummingbirds and parrots and even the peacock. Is there a teal bird? Red is the blood, is the heart, is the love. So if there is so much thing in line with this really specific strong color, um, and it's more or less part of your life. All of the greens that I use are very synthetic, and there's, some, there's, a, there's a nice sort of contradiction, I think, about using the color green in a synthetic way. I do like this color so much, I actually have three of these. I think we all want to move on. Uh, as you can imagine, there were some quite good characters. What it did was, like, this is brilliant, this, this is not a brilliant screen for showing colour accuracy. Um, it looks good here. Um, we got a, an amazing, amazing amount of data, um, actually far more than we thought we would. And so we're like, okay, shit, you know, we've got to do, do, do something with this data. Um, 
So um, some of the things we found, and it, it, you know, it, it gets more interesting as we go on, but the, some of the most common colors, and I think you heard some of those characters in that film um, talking about green, particularly slime green. Um, you know, that, that, that green and blue is over-indexed before any of the other colors, and, and the least chosen um, were black and white. We also got some really useful facts. So, you know, the weather at time of entry, sometimes it was minus 28 from Alaska, right through to 43 degrees in New Delhi. Um, twice as many women voted for their favorite color than men. So we thought that was, that's interesting. Um, saturated colors are far more um, popular than um, desaturated colors. And actually, the least popular colors were desaturated yellow greenish colors. So um, I think we can all imagine what that looks like. Average age of people that did partake in the thing was 33 years old, although thanks to Apple's system, um, quite a few people said they were born in 1900 because that's kind of a weird, you probably all had your Mac reset itself to 1900 at some point, um, and there were loads of those. So um, we, we, um, we put all of this into, um, into a k-means cluster algorithm, um, which calculated, um, I'm going to say this is actually a nightmare because this is not, my, this is not the latest presentation, so. Um, it actually, um, it, it, it <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Um, so it, it came out with this color, um, it, it calculated this color, um, which was, you can sort of see it on the screen, it's a, a, a teal green, um, and this actually turned out to be the world's favorite color. Um, it was um, submitted um, by a, a young lady whose surname was Mars. So she was actually, um, we actually named the paper after hers, um, Anne Mars, and she was from Dundee in East Scotland. And her inspiration for this was actually, um, it was inspired by the River Tay, and she, she felt that colour really, um, really symbolised that for her. So out of all of that data, and we'll come on to the science bit in a minute, how we got there, um, it actually outputted a single colour from 40,000 entrants. Now, what we were worried about, that would be the average colour. Um, and so we'll come on to the science. It was important that actually this was calculated in a way that um, it was not just the, the average, because that would just end up as being brown. Um, the colour was launched, GF Smith launched it, um, did some amazing things with lots of partner brands. You know, everyone wanted to produce a, a, an object in this colour. So from a kind of a, from a community point of view, from actually really getting the audience engaged um, across lots of different creative industries, um, the colour became a real hit from Urkel to Angle Poise to um, Brooks. People did some really, really cool stuff for us. So the science bit behind this, this was actually meant to come first before the um, the colour being revealed, um, but um, out of all of these colours, and there was, you know, so many that were, were submitted, so many different um, colours, we, um, we had to turn to someone who really knew what they were talking about, and I'm presuming that you all know what a k-means cluster algorithm is. <laughs> I, we obviously did. Um, I'll go back in time. What, how, how these things are calculated? And um, we can use, we can use um, pointillism as, as a really good way of looking at this. So in the late 1800s, George Surratt here was, um, he was sort of uh, credited with actually inventing pointillism, um, where obviously small dots of varying colors go up to make, make an image. Um, actually, how that works to the naked eye is the proximity of color to each other that actually allows the eye to create a kind of a, a color grouping if you, if you zoom into some of these, you can see how these color groups work. And it's really, simple, it's really similar to how um, computers actually de um, display text on a screen um, by using, you know, when they anti-alias at small size, if you zoom in, they're actually made of sort of a variety of tones in order to make our eyes um, make softer lines. So if we go back to our color algorithm, rather than create... Uh, a really kind of just a, a, an average, which would be the easy thing. What this does, it actually, um, a, a k-means algorithm actually looks at um, the color groupings. And so from that, it takes all of the colors and it puts them into groups, then it actually picks the most dominant within the group, and then it puts that, and that's how you kind of get a ranking of color. And then what that means is that you, um, you end up with a single tone that represents an entire plethora of colors. 
So it's actually exactly how the human eye works. So what we were trying to do here is get to a color that actually, you know, it's as much visual as it is scientific. Um, so it's kind of where the, I suppose, where the, where the art meets the science. Every single color that we, um, that we measured was given to us as a, as a piece of data, as a, as a sort of a color value. Um, and I think, you know, this, this, this enormous swathe of information started kind of giving us a lot more data. So we kind of, we identified the world's favorite color. That was great. The paper was launched. Everyone used it. It was all good. Um, but then we've actually been left with even more amazing information it after that and so we've been working with color you know color psychologists and actually see you know what can we what can we actually get from this from this data this huge like, database that we've got um and working with this working with anna franklin um this idea that actually you know how the human eye and this goes back to art and it goes back to how we how we see the world what we what, how we actually perceive color and how we actually use color how we respond to colour is, is, is fascinating. What was also fascinating is the descriptions that people gave us. I mean, it's almost like poetry. You know, um, you know the colour of clean, you know, a mango's blush, um, new beginnings for a certain colour. I mean, they were really beautiful. So you're kind of, you know, once you've got, you've got another way of looking at colour, you know, the descriptions that people give colours in their minds. So... This is kind of the second chapter now. We're like, okay, so we identified the world's favorite color, but what can we, be, what can we find from the, from, the, um, from the rest of the data? And actually, it's given us some really interesting things. So, for instance, you know, we know, we know what, the, what the color of forest is, but it's actually slightly different to the color of trees. These are the percentage color results. Um, interesting that the color of calm is almost exactly the same as calming, but yet the second two are... a uh, complete flip, almost the same colors. They all look the same on the screen, but they are subtly different. There were some that were really similar. So you've got um, peace and peaceful. So these words came up in people's you know, um, descriptions of their color. And when you start grouping the words, you realize actually they're all picking the same color, which was kind of amazing because actually it was nothing that we, you know, we, we didn't make it up. Well, not really. Anyway. Um, there were some that were completely opposite as well. So you've got things like relaxed and soothing. You'd think would kind of trigger the same colour in people's minds, but they don't. They're almost completely opposite. And, and some are completely different. Actually, they look the same on this screen. Um, optimistic and optimism. Completely flipped. Elegant and quality. Very similar. And then you look at groups like the creative, you know, that say like to the creative field, creative, create an art, kind of the same colours, but in really different priority orders. But then, you know, good old love, red was there, that was a result. Um, sexy is pinky purple, apparently. Um, but yeah, you know, stuff that you would expect to see, but actually when you actually see it as, as, as actual kind of information, it, is, it does become, become quite beautiful. What was interesting, out of all of those descriptions of all of those colors, the word romance and the word love did not get mentioned, which actually, you know, that, was, that really stood out, particularly with all the reds and all those sort of colors. So that was interesting. But we did actually identify, we've gone on um, as, as, as part of this whole color study, we've actually gone on to find out some, you know, some other really interesting colors for certain things. So if any of you have ever woken up and wondered what the color of the future will be, um, this is the color of future. Um, it's kind of mint green. Um, the color for change is, it's actually orange, sort of, sort of shitty brown on that screen. <laughs> so, uh, it's all about change. Um, the color for different is, um, and look how, Look how, you know, this is the, 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 most, the most dominant second one. Look how different, you know, those colors are. So to people, you, you start thinking, well, actually, that, that's, that's a really different result because actually they, people really have no idea. They're just trying to maybe be different. I don't know. Um, the color for freedom is blue, not the same mint green as all the other colors look like. Um, moody. Dark. And from this, we went on with, okay, so we kind of got into this now. This is where it kind of the, the, the inner geek at 
made thought came out, and Ben, the other partner, literally nearly lost his mind doing this. Um, well, yeah, he didn't really have much before, but he kind of got so immersed in the data of, of what it could be and how that could actually think. We actually said to G.F. Smith, look, can we kind of make more, more of this? Because we found the, world, you know, we found the world's favorite color, what can we do? So they were like, yeah, kind of, okay, if you think it's interesting, let's do it. So, and that's what, that's what they're kind of cool with, because they just let us kind of play in that sense. Um, so we then started kind of, you know, getting the guys in the studio to kind of take some of these colors and say, okay, well, you know, this is what people feel about blue. These are some of the words. And, the, and, and the, you know, so that circle's like massive, calm, um, you know, but, you know, classic air, uplifting, beautiful, electric, calm, you know, for greens. What is, you know, what, what is the feeling for greens? You know, it starts getting, now it starts getting emotive. You know, nature, ideas, earth, awesome, you know, which 24 people said, so I don't quite know how it made that. But, um, red, again, it was a very kind of simple one. And then you start grouping the colors, you know, what can they represent? Well, if you start actually sort of looking at um, sort of creative words, design, create, creative art, idea, you start getting a palette for creativity. Now, that, I, I'm, I'm not sure that's ever really been sort of at least documented. Um, interesting that um, luxury were all really dark colors. Dark blue, dark green, dark sort of purple. Emotion were really bright, really, you know, you know positive, bright, sunshine colors, which was kind of a relief. Nature. Interesting that the color of sunrise and the colors of sunset um, were almost the same. The colors of dusk compared to the colors of twilight. Interesting. You kind of start seeing where we're going. These are all starting to look like pieces of art that we'd love to say we made, but we didn't really. Um, the colors of oceans compared to the colors of lakes. The colors of tree compared to the colors of forest. So our kind of, you know, our response to this was, well, let's actually start making something quite graphic and something quite visual with this. So we started putting them, you know, showing these, these words and the percentage of color and the way the data could be expressed in a, in a, in a, in a more artistic way. Um, you know, this is the color of quiet. This is the color of loud. Uh, or this, rather the colors, plural. The colors of strong and the colors of confident. Interesting how different the third color is. I think I might have got into this way too much. Um, colors of sexy, as opposed to the colors of passionate. Warm and fiery. Interesting that actually the colors of fiery actually are how you would probably draw fire if you were seven. Uh, <laughs> so then we kind of made a, a grid of, of, of things and actually started expressing these as groups. So these were all the colors that spoke, about, that spoke about fashion, sustainability, beauty, not for profit. Interesting that these terms even came up as some of the, some of the information. So we took all that, like we had a shitload of data, so much stuff, we were like, okay, so what we actually kind of spoke to G.F. Smith about, and this is what has just been launched, I think it launched, that they've got a show space in London, some of you might know about it, it opened, I think, earlier this week, so this is like, I'm not actually meant to be talking about it, it's, um, it's, uh, but they said I could a little bit. Um, we've put all of this information um, into two things, and that's a, a really um, beautiful sort of three-dimensional um, exhibition of, 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 these, of all of this data. Um, it almost becomes quite sort of artistic. These are just obviously all made out of G.F. Smith paper. Um, but you know, we've actually sort of visually represented all of the findings within their show space. And just to stop us going mad, um, we kind of documented everything into this color report that is just about to be released or has just been released. Um, and I'm sure G.F. Smith would gladly distribute it. Um, it's uh, actually quite an interesting um, read, but you flick through it, and we've talked about, you know, um, all the, everything I've just rambled on about is in there. But actually, when you flick through the book, actually, it becomes, you know, kind of art that we didn't, you know, I've got no, um, I, we didn't create it. The, the data sort of created it. But actually, the output of it and the, and the sort of the visual response to all of that information actually ended up being not just 
um, compelling on a visual side, but actually it really took your imagination and you really got people to think about um, how important just colour as a, as a thing is, not just, to, not just to our eyes, but also to language, to the words we speak. Um, and I think that, that's really, uh, for, for, for me, how people actually speak about colour and think about it. And, and responded to our really simple idea, please pick your favourite colour and tell us why. You know, it's turned into something far bigger for us, for, for, for Geo Smith, obviously as, a, as the people that are behind it, but really that, that sort of fascination of, of, you know, everybody's opinion, everybody's, you know, thoughts towards colour and then put it into something that actually kind of is a really... Um, lovely document was actually incredibly rewarding and so although it's not art in its in its true self but actually sometimes you know people make art in sort of a, in a sort of accidental ways and I'd like to think that this was one of them so thanks very much Sort of 